of Academic Affairs at Zahra Institute and Associate Professor of Sociology at John Jay College, City University of New York. It's my great, great pleasure to welcome you all to Zahra Institute's annual lecture. Zahra Institute is a Chicago-based nonprofit educational institution with interest in promoting Kurdish studies in higher education in the United States. The spring terms programs include an online Kurdish studies certificate program, which will start in April. Check out the website for upcoming programs. Our speaker today is Martin Van Brunessen. Martin is Professor Emeritus of the Comparative Study of Contemporary Muslim Societies at Utrecht University. He carried out anthropological field research in Kurdistan, all parts of Kurdistan in the mid 1970s and has been returning to Kurdistan more or less regularly ever since. The social and political role of religion has been central, a central concern of his research. He is the author of the pioneering work Allah, Sheikh, and State, The Social and Political Structures of Kurdistan, and Mullahs, Sufis, and Heretics, The Role of Religion in Kurdish Study, a Society. Excuse me. The title of this lecture today uh, is Kurdish Medrese in Republican Turkey, an institution of civil society caught between Turkish state and Kurdish political movement. Before I turn the mic over to Professor Van Brunessen, here are a few housekeeping notes. Martin will speak for about 40 minutes, after which we will have a 20 minute Q&A session. In the interest of time and functionality, I, I encourage you to submit your questions in written form. You can write them in the chat panel. Uh, please address them only to the host, which you will see labeled with the Zara Institute logo. You will see there's only one person, that's the, uh, the host with the logo. And now to the co-hosts. I will select as many questions as possible to pose to Martin. If time allows, there may also be a chance for some of you to pose your questions directly to him. I want to thank Martin for agreeing to join us today. And especially to thank all of you. We have more than 200 people uh, you know, registering. So we expect to see more people joining us from all over the world. So um, uh, please turn your mics off um, while the speaker is speaking. So without further ado, let's begin. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mujahid. Thank you to you and thank you to the Zahra Institute for inviting me for the, to this talk. And also thank you for thinking of the best subject, the madrasa. <laughs> I think that 20, 30 years ago, if there had been a Zahra Institute, the madrasa might not have been the first subject I thought of. The madrasa has in the past decade, perhaps two decades, received a lot of new attention. Uh, many people of different backgrounds have started looking at the madrasa as one of the foundational institutions of Kurdish society. Uh, perhaps the major carrier of Kurdish culture. The first great Kurdish authors of Kurdish literature, Fakir Tehran, Malaya Jezeri, Ahmed Ekhani, were in one way or the other associated with Kurdish madrasas and their works were read and handed down mainly in the madrasa environment. Without madrasas, we might not know anymore who Ahmed Ekhani was. In, in talking about madrasas, I often sense in people a sense of nostalgia. It is like talking about the other important institution of Kurdish history, the Emirate, the semi-independent political institution that had political power. The madrasa was an institution that did not have political but cultural power and often was under the patronage of the emirates. So these two institutions represent two dimensions, a political and a cultural dimension of Kurdish society that, has, that have represented a form of continuity throughout history, but met with 
the process of modernization and discontinuities. In the mid 19th century, the last emirates were abolished and the madrasas, well, we don't know exactly. In almost every source I know about the madrasa, they talk about the past. The madrasa existed, but it was established, it was abolished or it vanished. But it is not very clear when this was, how far away this past was. And as I will say later on in this talk, that past was perhaps not very far away, was perhaps very, very near. If you allow me, if you allow me, I'd like to start with a few personal experiences to say why I am interested in the madrasa and how I became first acquainted with the madrasa. I started my field work as an anthropologist in Kurdistan in 1974. I had already read quite a bit, but my knowledge of Islam at that time was very, very superficial, very insufficient. I had heard about madrasas. I knew that the madrasas in Turkey were allegedly abolished in 1924 with a law for the unification of education and standardization of the schooling system abolishing all independent, independent of the state, independent forms of education. Uh, just like the Sufi orders were abolished a year later. My interest was not so much in religion originally, but in politics and in the origins of Kurdish nationalism. And for that reason, I was interested in Sufi orders, initially not in their religious aspect, their spiritual aspect, but mainly because I knew that leaders of Sufi orders, of the Naqshbandiya and of the Qadiriya, had played important roles in rebellions that were often seen as nationalist or proto-nationalist. In 1880, the Sheikh Ubaidullah rebellion, Around 1920, the rebellions of Sheikh Mahmoud in Iraqi Kurdistan, in Sleimania. And in 1925, the rebellion of Sheikh Said in Turkey. All these three people will come back in my talk. Because of those rebellions, my, I was interested in, in Sufi orders. And I tried to visit Sufi teachers and Sufi sheikhs. Uh, in 1971, when I was in Jizre, I heard that one of the most famous sheikhs and also ulama, uh, Islamic scholars of, of, of Kurdistan, Sheikh Seda, had died a few years earlier, but his house was still there and his son was there. I knocked on the door and I was welcomed and I ended up staying there for several days and coming back another time and staying again several weeks and becoming friends with his son, Sheikh Nurola. From Sheikh Nurola, I learned a lot about the non-political aspects of the Naqshbandi order, but also something that only in retrospect I recognized. I, I think I saw a madrasa in 1975, but no one told me it was a madrasa. They may have used the term hujra, but I did not recognize it for what it was. I did notice people, some young, some older, sitting together and reading books, sitting on the ground, reading and sometimes talking a little bit with one another, but I did not realize what it was that I saw. In my visits to several of the villages, especially somewhat isolated villages that were rather distant from the state, I met young or middle-aged Mele, village imams, who seemed to be like natural authorities in spite of their relatively low education and young age, who were 
liked and respected by the people and who thinking back many years later, I think should be considered organic intellectuals, rooted, more rooted than the school teachers. That was another type of young intellectual that I often encountered who were closer to my own mentality at that time. Many villages I could visit because I went there with the village teacher and I stayed in the village teacher's house and I discussed with the village teacher and only with the villages, villagers who came to see the village teacher. I recognize now that there were two different types of local intellectuals and that the village mellow who had a different type of education, but knew quite a bit about the world because he had traveled, uh, was closer to many people in the village than the teacher. The teacher was an outsider. He came from a different culture and he came with a mission. He wanted to educate, he wanted to change, he wanted to bring revolution, he, been, he wanted to break the power of the power holders, the, the landlords, if there were, and the power of religion. Whereas these young Mele were not subservient to power, but they were, they were culturally closer. They had a self-evident authority to the, for the villages. They did mediate in conflicts and often they were also people who had a wider horizon than their, their co-villages and therefore acted as brokers with the world outside, especially when people from outside came visiting, such as myself or state officials. It was often the Mele who spoke, who was an intermediary between the villages and those officials. Now, I had a sense that these people had been educated, but they were never very clear about where and how they were educated. It was not in state schools, some of them said. But where? Later, I realized that there must have been functioning madrasas at that time, in the 70s, which was a relatively liberal period. And that others had studied in neighboring countries, in Syria, where especially Amuda was a a place where many Turkish or Kurdish mullahs were educated, or in Iraqi Kurdistan. Towards the end of my stay in Turkey, I also met Mehmet Emin Bozarslan, whom I had long admired from a distance because I had read about the political trials after the military coup in 1971. He was on trial for three books that he had written and also for the content of his books. He had translated Ahmadi Ghani's Mamouzin from Kurdish into Turkish. He had translated the Sharaf Name, a history of the Kurdish ruling houses written in 1597 in Persian, translated from Persian into Turkish. And he translated somewhat later a text in Arabic the, on the Marwani uh, an early Kurdish state in the area around Silvan, from Arabic to Turkish. And he had written a book about the sheikhs and agas, which was clearly inspired by a, a reformist Islamic frame of mind. Mehmet Emin Boz Aslan had only a madrasa education. He never went to school. And only at a later age, he did a state exam in order to be, uh, to, 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 get an ex to get a diploma without ever having gone to, properly gone to school. And he made it to Mufti in Kulp. Mehmet Min Bozaslan remained a friend and I think I have learned a lot, especially about the madresse uh, initially from Mehmet Emin. Years later, when I visited the refugee community of Kurds from Turkey in Sweden, we are now talking about the late 80s, 
I met a young man whom I had first met him in Patman in 1975, Zainal Abedin Zanar. Zainal Abedin had been arrested a few times in the early 80s, although he was not politically active. And he said that he had been tortured. He even wrote a book about his torture. And one thing that his torture is said is, well, Kurds do not exist. They are not a people. Kurdish is not a language. If it's a language, you say it's a language, show me, but where is a book in Kurdish? And he said, from that time on, my mission in life is to show that books in Kurdish exist. Uh, meanwhile, he has published more than 20 books. The first books that he did publish in, in Sweden were a type of Kurdish literature that I had not been aware of before, that had never been printed before. It was the divans of the Kurdish sheikhs and malas, the divan of Abdurrahman Ahtepi and other members of the family of Ahtepi. Uh, later, he also wrote a book about madrasa education, the first publication that gave a detailed description of the curriculum, of the books being studied, and also of the way they were being studied, and of the way of life of the FEPI, the, the students, in the village, and how the village supported the students. Meanwhile, I left Kurdistan and for a number of reasons, I had to go to another part of the world. I stayed in Indonesia for about 10 years. And in Indonesia, I again, purely by accident, ended up frequenting and studying madrasas, Indonesian madrasas. Indonesians adhere to the Shafi'i school of law, which is very important. I mean, the school of law is perhaps the most important subject in, in madrasa education just like the Kurds. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Turkey know that Turks over, in general tend to be Hanifis and the Kurds, most Kurds tend to be Shafi'is. Studying Indonesia, therefore, I felt that I was becoming, beginning to understand more about the Kurdish madrasa, which was so similar. I noticed that the books being studied in Indonesia were very similar to those I wrote, I corresponded with Mehmet Amin Bosaslan at that time, those that Mehmet Amin Bosaslan had studied. And when Zainal Abedin Zana wrote his book, I recognized that it was almost identical, except for the most recent books that were not in the, in the Kurdish curriculum. It was almost identical with the curriculum of uh, the, the Kurdish curriculum and the Indonesian curriculum were almost identical. 1991 is in Turkey a very important year because then the law that banned publishing in other languages than Turkish was lifted. And suddenly it became possible to publish in Kurdish inside Turkey. So many of those who had pioneered Kurdish publishing in Sweden returned from Sweden to Turkey and started or continued publishing there. And it was a number of new journals published in, in Istanbul. And in this context, one journal in particular, Nubahar, is very important. It, was, it started publication in 1991, and until today, that is for 30 years, it has published an issue regularly every month. Uh, that's unique among Kurdish journals. The name Nubahar refers to a book by uh, Ahmadi Ghani, a very simple book for children uh, that is studied among the first books in the Madrasa curriculum. The Nubaha group is close to one particular wing of the Nur movement in Turkey, but like the Zahra Institute called the Zahra group, um, nonetheless, in the Nubahar Martin, sorry Journal, to interrupt, we have no affiliation with them. <laughs> sorry? Zahra Institute has no affiliation with uh, Zahra Vakfu. I, I, yes, yes, yes. Just Nevertheless, the, the inspiration of the name must be yes. quite similar. Right? Exactly. Precisely. <laughs> yes. Thank you. 
Uh, although Nubahar was as as a as a journal of the Zahra group uh, close to the Noor movement, and the Noor movement itself does not have madrasas, Nubaha paid a lot of attention to madrasas and people teaching in madrasas. And in, in more recent years, besides the journal, they published a number of books. They published divans of uh, uh, Kurdish ulama and a whole series of other publications, uh, life histories of several prominent ulama. Oh, one more <clears throat> interesting experience I had in, when was that? That must have been in the in around 2000, when I visited Diyarbakir and before 2000, I was in, getting interested in Hezbollah. I know there were fights between Hezbollah and the PKK and uh, I visited the famous bookshops and I noticed in the first place that one of the bookshops also sold a book written by one of my one of the ulama i knew from indonesia an indonesian alim uh, who commented on a sufi work by ghazali and is trying to make a conversation with people who were buying books there books that were clearly not books used in imam hatib schools in turkish state schools or even in the theological faculty but books that were belong to the traditional curriculum that is not used in state institutions. I asked, where did you learn of these books? Where did you study them? And he answered something that I still do not really understand. He said in Turkish, harichte, meaning outside. I, I understood it outside the school system, but it could also mean outside the country. He might have studied in Syria, or he might have studied in, in an underground or very unconspicuous madrasa inside Turkey, but one that is outside the state system. I like this expression, haritste, uh, being outside the state, not necessarily against the state, but being independent, outside. Uh, my last madrasa encounter was a visit to a madrasa that was inside. Uh, an interesting phenomenon. The uh, Dianet, which has un under the AKP, under the present government, enormously expanded, has provincial and regional branches that are called Muftuluk. And the Muftuluk has mosques, Quran courses, and so on. And there are uh, state schools to train imams. For fun to function in state-controlled mosques. Uh, in one of the uh, Quran course buildings owned by Dianet, I noticed a madrasa. They had built uh, stacks of beds for around 20 students who were living there, who in the daytime were studying some of them in Imam Hatib schools, in uh, secondary education, state institutions to train Imams. Others were studying at the University of uh, Diyarbakir in the daytime, but in the late afternoon and evening and in the weekends, they were studying traditional style madrasa. So they were studying modern books, a, the modern st state curriculum, but and besides, studying with a different method, the traditional method, sitting in a circle, one-on-one, -on -one, or peer learning in a group of four, or listening to a teacher explaining and making notes in the margins of their uh, Arabic thick books. And that Seda, the, the teacher of that madrasa, told me that he himself had been trained in this way. But in order to get an income, he had done a state exam so that he was recognized also as a graduate of an Imam Hatib school. He was officially appointed as an Imam in Hatib, but at the same time, he continued teaching as a Seda in the traditional style. So he was combining the state function inside and the alternative function on the side, using the facilities of the state 
for something that the state, I think, does not really know about or does not want to know about, but that still appears to continue. Well, I, I may have spoken a little bit too much about my, my own experiences. I will go back and become a little bit more scholarly. Madrasas have a long history and the most early madrasas were established by states. And it was like that in the Ottoman Empire. Big cities in what is now Turkey, the cities like Diyarbakir or Van, had many madrasas, typically established by sultans or a vizier or a provincial governor. Many of the madrasas were excellent, beautiful buildings, very spectacular architecture. Uh, the madrasas were teaching within a centralized state control system called the Ilmia in the Ottoman Empire. There was a hierarchy. A teacher, if he was successful, a professor in one of these institutions, if he was successful, he was promoted to a position in a, in a more important city. Uh, graduates of those madrasas uh, could become muftis uh, or judges, teachers, and also many other bureaucratic positions were available to them. The teaching was based on the Hanifi, the official uh, school of law. In the 16th, 17th, 18th century, we find besides these Ottoman state madrasas, which uh, in which the professors circulated and the most successful ones ended up in Istanbul teaching in the, uh, in the Suleymaniye or in the Selimiye. Besides these, we had in the Kurdish Emirates, which had a high degree of independent, independence, we find a similar type of madrasas, also beautiful buildings. If you go to Bitlis or Cizre or even a uh, Amadia, today you can still find the buildings. Uh, the emirs, the, the local rulers, had clearly invested a lot of money in a, a building a prestigious school. The Ottoman traveler Evliya Celebi, one of my favorites, uh, some of whose travels I've been trying to follow visited many parts of Kurdistan in the mid 17th century. In 1655, he was in Diyarbakir and in Van. And he also visited, so Diyarbakir and Van are Ottoman state controlled cities with state controlled madrasas. But he also visited the three capitals of the most powerful Kurdish emirates, Bitlis, Jizre and Ahmadiyya. Now it's interesting, he describes the madrasas of Diyarbakir and uh, Van and mainly speaks about the architecture and about uh, who sponsored it. And on one madrasa, led by a famous Kurdish sheikh, the, the sheikh of Rumia, who I later found out is a distant ancestor of Sheikh Said the famous Sheikh Said of 1925. So the Sheikh of Rumia had a great madrasa and a teke, a Sufi lodge in the Arbukir that Evliya describes, he gives a long story about this Sheikh. But his description of the Kurdish Emirates is more interesting. He says in those Emirates, they study not only the Islamic sciences, like uh, doctrine, uh, Islamic law and so on, and Arabic, but also philosophy. And not only ulum, the Islamic sciences, but also funun, the, the uh, natural sciences. He speaks of books. He says of one of the madrasas in Ahmadiyya, 
that it has a library with 10,000 books. That was obviously before printing, so 10,000 manuscripts. He may be exaggerating a bit, but he was clearly impressed by the library. He also noted that the ulama in those madrasas, the, the Kurdish ulama, especially in Ahmadiyya, were all poets. He even cites a poem. We know that the, great, the poet normally considered the greatest metaphysical poet of Kurdish literature, Malaya Jazari, was also uh, teaching in a madrasa. And he lies buried in the courtyard of the Red Madrasa in Jizri. So from Evliya Celebi, we get the impression that the Kurdish madrasa in those times, when the emirates were flourishing and had a high degree of independence, where a place of where the sciences and literature flourished and were patronized by the Kurdish emirs. After the abolition of the emirates, which happened in the course of the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century, we find a new type of madrasa becoming more prominent or perhaps only more visible because the emirates have dropped out of visibility and the protection for their madrasas disappeared. We find madrasas associated with a small number of great families of scholars and Sufis. And recently I've started thinking that in this respect, the Kurdish Sunnis resemble Yazidis and Alevis and Ahli Haq very much. The Ahli Haq religion and Alevism can be defined as a religion that depends on the presence of families of hereditary spiritual leaders called Sayyid and often claiming direct descendant from the Prophet Muhammad. You find the same among the Ahli Haq and among the Yazidis, they don't call themselves Sayyids, but they have sheikhs and peers who are her hereditary castes and some of whom also appear to be the descendants of scholars. And in the case of the Yazidis, the most famous of those scholars, Sheikh Adi, was in fact an Arab, believed to be related to the family of the Omayyads, who had come from Syria to central Kurdistan. So families of people who have a high charisma and who appear to be dependent from the prophet or somehow else have some indirect connection with the, with the divine, have given shape to those heterodox communities, but among the Sunnis we find something very similar. If I mention the name of a few families like the Barzinjis, the most famous Sayyids of Iraqi Kurdistan, you find Barzinjis all over the world nowadays. They are very prominent in Islamic sciences and in Sufism. Uh, in Hakari, the, the most distant southeastern point of Turkey, in Nehri, there was the famous family of the Sayyids of Nehri, to which Sheikh Ubaidullah belong, belonged, who in 1880, 1880 led a rebellion, and whose descendants have also been involved in Kurdish politics, though not in separatism. And the third family of great Sayyids is the family of the Sheikh of Rumia, whom I mentioned, whom Evliya describes quite extensively, and who appears to be a, the uh, ancestor of the family of Sheikh Said. Those three, I think, are the greatest, the most widely recognized family of Sayyids. All of these families had a tradition of establishing in the places where members of the family established themselves, establishing side by side a teke, a Sufi lodge for spiritual exercises, usually for the older people, and the medrese, a teaching center for teaching the young, teaching Islamic sciences. <laughs> 
Now, in the course of the 19th century, when these three were the most prominent families, people who had been trained by them established themselves up and set themselves up as secondary ojaks, or secondary dynasties of, again, hereditary teachers. Like you find the sheikhs of Ghizan, the sheikhs of Dagh, the sheikhs of Norshin, and a number of other quite famous places in southeastern Turkey. They belong to the generations after those that had been first initiated by members of these three large families. And I think from there on we get what I would like, to, what I'd like to call the, the vernacular madrasa, a much simpler type of madrasa, a village type of madrasa, no spectacular building, nothing extraordinary about architecture, often just one room or two rooms adjoined to a village mosque, and sometimes not even that. It is just a place where a small number of young people come together and learn the basics, learn to read and write, learn to read the Quran, learn some Arabic grammar, starting in Kurdish with Kurdish textbooks and then shifting, shifting to Arabic books in the later years. Now, the, the curriculum of those madrasas seems to be quite standardized. I have found among four of in four or five authors lists of the books that they studied or their informants had studied and they're almost identical. So there is a standardized Islamic curriculum completely outside the state, not related to any of the state madrasas and perhaps also rather different from the great Kurdish madrasas of Bitlis, Ahmadiyya and Jizre of the 17th century. These village madrasas are independent of state support. The teacher does not have a salary unless he is at the same time a state employed imam. But as a teacher, he has no salary. It is only the rich people of the neighborhood who give their zakat to maintain him and to, to buy clothes once a year for the students. And the individual students are often adopted by a single family in the village. So one student is adopted by one family that brings him food every day. If you're lucky, you're adopted by a family that has good food, but some people complain that they are not so lucky and they never ate anything good for three or four years. Having finished the entire curriculum, you are called muntahi, someone who has completed the school, and a mele of the 12 sciences, and you receive an ijaza to teach. And in theory, and I have no idea how often it worked in practice. In theory, someone who has the ijaza of an imam of the 12 sciences is entitled to establish his own madrasa in another village. And often it went like that, probably, that this man went to another village, found some people to sponsor his existence and started teaching. So we see from the great families to lesser important sheikhly families, uh, vernacular education spreads to villages. Besides the religious uh, texts of the curriculum, it is also remarkable that in the madrasa, students read texts that are not taught. Like Ghani, some of Ghani's, uh, Ahmadi Ghani's texts, uh, Nubahar and Akida Imane, are basic texts for beginners, and therefore I think Ghani is a respected name. But Ghani's Mamouzin, which is a much more difficult text, Mamouzin was widely read by Madrasa students, but never taught. It is like one of the things that you learn to read through peer learning. The same is true for Saadi, the Persian poet Saadi, whose Golestan I found 
widely read in, in, in Kurdish madrasa circles. People use it to learn Persian. I, mean, I knew some Persian at the time when I was traveling there. I found Saadi very difficult to understand and I do not think any, how anyone who reads Saadi can understand more than spoken Persian, but many people managed. And if I look at Mehmet Emin Bosarslan, who in this way learned Persian, I mean, his translation of the Sharaf Nama is really very good. So taking Mehmet Emin Bosarslan as one example, is the, the quality of the education in some cases was very, very, very solid. Now, what happened to these madrasas after 1924, when the Turkish state abolished the madrasas? Well, obviously, all state madrasas were closed. There was no money for them. People were fired. And for those madrasas, I think the ban on madrasa education was quite effective. But Kurdish madrasas did not need state support. They are much less visible. And we realize now that the ban did not affect them very much. They simply continued functioning. But there was another event that did have a, a, a very negative effect on them. The Kurdish uprisings of the 1920s and 1930s led to a lot of repression in Kurdistan and charismatic leaders of the Kurds who were believed to be able to mobilize people were removed from the common villages. So Aras and Sheikhs were deported to other parts of the country, separated from those among whom they had influence. Uh, there were also the gendarmerie. There's many reports from the late 1930s and 1940s of the gendarme, the, the military the part of the army that has police functions on the countryside, where the gendarme went to a village and if they found a madrasa, people were arrested or kicked uh, or beaten. And the, the, whatever was found in the madrasa was destroyed. People complained about a lot of oppression in the 1930s and 1940s. There is some relief after the Second World War when Turkey wants to join the Western bloc in the Cold War, which means that Turkey has to make some political reforms. It becomes a multi-party state. Uh, parties compete in elections. Parties have to be popular among the people. And that gives some room for, mob for negotiation to the conservative religious authorities who find themselves represented by the Democratic Party in the 1950s uh, in the 1930s and 40s when people wanted to have a religious education they could no longer get it in Turkey they had to go to Iraq or to Syria in the 1950s we find that many old madrasas that had been closed down, are silently opened up again. There are many reports of people studying inside Turkey in the 1950s. In 1960, there is again a military coup, which targets very specifically, uh, not only the Democratic Party, but those in the Kurdish areas who have been supporting the Democratic Party, including the family of Sheikh Said and many other religious families. And the madrasas are again suppressed. There is another new development. Again, it started already in the 50s and continued in the 70s and 80s. The state establishes, after first having bent the madrasa, it establishes a new type of school to train religious personnel. Imams who can lead a prayer in the mosque. Imams who can explain Islam in a way that is not in conflict with the interest of the state or not in conflict with the Turkish conception of secularism. So the, these so-called Imam Hatib schools gradually expand and conservative religious people and the parties 
the Democratic Party, later the Justice Party, later the uh, Motherland Party, the, the political parties that seek the support of the conservative religious segment of the population, managed to not only expand the number of schools, but also raise the level of education, the number of years of the school, and the number of institutions to which a diploma from those schools gave access. If you wanted to get a job, if you wanted to get a state paid job as a religious person, you had to have an Imam Hatib diploma. You couldn't get it with a ijazah from, uh, from a madrasa. So there is a sort of competition between the new state Imam Hatib schools and the madrasa. And many people feel that in order to get some security, some financial security, you, you, you have to choose the Imam Hatib school. Although everyone feels that the Imam Hatib school does not really teach proper Islam. It's Islamic, of course, but you don't learn good Arabic the way you learn it in a madrasa. You learn about Islamic law, but you don't learn the basics of, of the thinking of the fuqaha, of the, Islam, of the Islamic legal scholars. So there is, and there remains a tension between, uh, between these two institutions. Until 1965, graduates of madrasas still managed to find employment in the Diyanet institution, in the Turkish state institution for uh, religious guidance. Uh, but in 65, that's, that stops. So from then on, the madrasa has little to offer to young people. And many people think that that gave the death blow to, to the madrasa. So a man who is very knowledgeable, Ismail Kara, has written an interesting article about He's himself not a Kurd, he's a, a, a Turk from Western Turkey, but he appreciated the Kurdish madrasa as an, as an institution of a high level of intellectual uh, discourse. And he, he believed that after 1965, th there was no madrasas anymore. Uh, several of the other publications that I came, my friend uh, Zain Labadin Zanar said, well, 1960s, early 1970s, that was the last, but then in, this, in the 1970s, the last madrasa has closed. And as I told earlier, I, I noticed that the nature of the madrasa may have changed, but there are still madrasas, although they're no longer completely independent institutions. They try to find a sort of symbiosis with the state institution by adding to it, not competing with the state institution, but taking what the state offers, taking that Islamic discourse and that form of education and adding to it that what is believed to be beautiful and important in the classical tradition. A different style of teacher-disciple relations, a different style of learning in which memorizing is perhaps more important. Um, and a, a different curriculum. Now, I'm not the only person who says nice things about a madrasa as an important symbol of Kurdish culture, an important carrier of Kurdish culture, as a, an aspect of Kurdish culture that has not received enough attention. Nowadays, it is quite popular to say these things. And it is perhaps easy to overstate the quality of madrasa education. Uh, some early graduates of these Kurdish madrasas, like the poet Jigar Khuin, who studied in a madrasa in Syria and graduated as a mela of the 12 sciences, he is caustic about uh, madrasa education. He thinks it makes people only stupid. Mehmet Emin Bozaslan writes very negative, not about the madrasa, to which he obviously owed quite a lot, but about the institution of the sheikh and the Sufi order that he finds very oppressive. 
and uh, not corresponding at all to his more reformist Islamist understanding. And also, after all, I'm talking to the Zahra Institute. Uh, Bedu Zaman, Sayed Nursi, of course, is very interesting in his attitude towards the madrasa. On the one hand, we may say he is a product of the madrasa. He did visit some madrasa in the area of Bitlis and uh, Aare. Although he has no very friendly words for it in his autobiography. He often stayed a very little, and he used little time to study all the books they read and then be even more knowledgeable than his teacher. Uh, but Yuseman is, is known for his ideal to reform education in Kurdistan and give the Kurds a real university, the Madrasa to Zahra, which should be the equivalent of Egypt's Al Azhar where modern sciences and the Islamic sciences were to be studied in harmony together. Uh, he never got it. Although there continue to be attempts to establish schools that pretend to be as of as high quality as Bedou Zaman intended. I think neither the Nurju Dersane nor the Imam Hatib school is a solution to the sense of loss that people feel when they think nostalgically about the quality of classical madrasa education. The idea of a rooted cultural religious education besides high quality modern university education obviously is a good one, but I still have to find the institution that can offer it. I'm almost there. In the past decades, we have seen a struggle over the symbolic power of the madrasa between interesting partners, the power of the madrasa and the power of its embedded organic intellectuals. The man who was to establish Hezbollah, the Kurdish Hezbollah, Hussein Veliolu, was strongly influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood and its revolutionary thought. But after the Iranian revolution spent a long time in Iran and thought he needed an Islamic revolution of the Iranian type. And seeing that the Melev, the Kurdish Melev, were really rooted organic intellectuals, he thought the Kurdish Mele should be revolutionized and become revolutionary fighters like the Kurdish, like the Iranian ulama. This is what he tried to do with Hezbollah. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the, the mainstream Kurdish national movement, PKK and the legal HDP, who have, the KDP, PKK made many gestures towards Islam, and especially towards the Mela, since the 1980s already. And in the 2010s, they have organized a few democratic Islam conferences where they try to find a more systematic encounter, negotiation with the conservative Muslim circles that were also not only conservative and Muslim, but also strongly Kurdish. There was an attempt to establish civil Friday prayers. And I think at a particular time, so between 2010 and 2014, you might say, there are three different types of imams in a place like the Arbakir. There are the state imams, some of them Kurdish, but appointed by the state and preaching the khutbah in the state khutbah in a state mosque. There are Hezbollah allied, well, close to the Hezbollah movement, imams. And there are the imams who feel more close to the mainstream national movement. And it is those people who protesting against the state and its Friday prayer in, this, in the state mosque started organizing Friday prayers in the street, 
like truly civil society activism on the street, but Islamic activism on the street. So they called it the civil, civil Jumalar, the civil Friday prayers. Uh, it is interesting that the Mela and thereby implicitly the, the Madrasa have become a core function of contestation between the three different powers, two powers in Kurdish civil society, frontally opposed to one another, and the state. And with these words, I think I would like to stop my talk and I'm quite curious if there are interesting questions. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for a fascinating uh, tour of both your personal encounter with the institution of Madrasa and your scholarly analysis, a kind of historical overview of its development and important turning points. As you were speaking, um, it reminded me an anecdote of mine. Uh, I grew up in Silvan, uh, where there was a Nurju uh, Dersane, and Nurju Dersane used to be called Medrese, mm -hmm. and in Turkish context, they were called Dersane. So you can see the transition there. And but by you were studying, hmm? go ahead. You were not studying Madrasa curriculum there. No, not at all. So that's my, the, my yeah. that's the point. So Said Nursi, in a sense, represents a, he belongs to the mod modernity or, you know, modernizing moment rather than the traditional, you know, classical education. So his relation, you know, ambivalent relationship with Medrese is interesting. He wants to perpetuate the Islamic tradition, but he finds that uh, curriculum uh, ineffective or, you know, outdated uh, and so uh, interestingly when imams were joining Nurju circles and there was Mela Hikmet in Silvan about whom I wrote even a column in the past was a very uh, dedicated uh, uh, Mela uh, he's still alive uh, very nice guy he would you know donate half of his salary to the community or you know whatever uh, the expenses of the place uh, one interesting thing was that he didn't have formal education for imamhood. So he had to go to Imam Hatib school, you know, externally they take the tests. Yeah. So this decent moral imams were forced to cheat in the, in the tests. So because I remember he had this, uh, you know, cheating stuff for psychology exam in which they are asking about defense mechanisms and, you know, and terribly, unfortunately, they were using, uh, you know, uh, the kind of more foreign uh, language like projection and you know uh, mm -hmm. things like that which totally was you know hard for for them to do so it, it, it in in this kind of case you could see this transition to the new world the pool and the survival needs of you know having given active credentials uh, kind of being attentive to this new opening uh, underside nurses kind of uh, influence and uh, keeping in touch with his uh, congregation. When he was uh, offering hutbans in his masjid, uh, his congregation loved him. They said, you know, our imam is a great guy, but he's talking about birds and flowers and things like that. <laughs> because Said Nursi had this turn towards nature, which yes. was a new thing in the, you know, the, the book of universe is really going to replace the original sacred book inside Nursi because science has become the new path to truth. And of course, we just don't perceive it this way, but you know, the, the grand book of universe is the new sacred book and science itself becomes religious activity, you know, scientific stuff. Uh, so he, he would, you know, partly uh, participate in this kind of discourse in his communication with his uh, uh, Jamaat and the, you know, people, elderly citizens were, you know, they want to hear about the hell fire and the, you know, paradise rather than <laughs> birds and the Esmaul uh, Husna. Uh, so, okay, I, I would like to now stop. And uh, there are a couple of questions, so I'm gonna offer them to you, unless you wanna say something in reaction to what I said, but it's mostly an anecdote. Okay, so our first question is uh, from Asli Elitsoy, and uh, 
question is, as you already mentioned, despite officially shutting down of madrasas, they continued operating clandestinely in the Southeast, unlike Western part of the country. As far as I know, this was the main reason why many Turkish Islamists also visited the Kurdish cities to get madrasa education. So what is the function of the madrasa in the relationship between Kurdish and Turkish Islamists? How do madrasa shape their relationship? Well, that's a difficult, that, that question is difficult to answer, Asli. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, I am aware that, I do not know how many, but I'm, I'm aware that Turks who wanted to have a traditional Islamic education had to go to Eastern Turkey to get it. Most famous example, perhaps, is Turan Dursun, who later wrote, later became an atheist and wrote a number of interesting books. His first book, Kuletain, is about life in the Kurdish madrasa, and it is not exactly positive about the, the state of affairs in the Kurdish madrasas. Uh, between Turkish and Kurdish Islamists, there have always been tense relations. Even if you look at Turkiyeli, Turkish in the sense of Turkey-wide organizations like the Akuncular, which in the 1970s was the youth organization of the Mili Gurush movement. Among the Akunjalar, there was the, the, the most activist ones were of Kurdish background. And often they had some madrasa connection also because the leader, one of the most charismatic leaders of the Akunjalar was Metin Yüksel, the son of Sadretin Yüksel, who had been the major teacher at the famous madrasa of Norshin. So between Norshin and the, the, the charisma of the Yüksel family and political Islamist activism in Istanbul in the 1970s, there is a connection. Uh, in his memoirs, the brother of Metin Yüksel uh, writes that in those days, there were three political movements. There was the, the left, there, were, there was the right, the fascists, and there was the Islamists. But in the view of the, of the, of the right wing, the Islamists, who were a relatively small group, were all considered uh, green communists, Islamic communists, and they were put in the same bed. So, communication between the, the radicalized Kurdish Islamists and Turkish Islamists was always a little tense. And even if you look at those who have survived from those days, who are still active now, and I know a few of them, you feel that they have increasingly taken distance from Turkish, both as Turk and as Turkiyeli Islamism. Even Hezbollah, the leader of Hezbollah, uh, uh, Hussein Veliolu, he said that although he also had initially had connections with the Mili Gurush movement, he became very disaffected with the leader of Mili Gurush, uh, Erbakan, because he said behind this discourse of we are all brothers, Muslim and Turk, the Kurt Hamal discourse, as uh, Mujahid calls it. Uh, Behind this discourse of Via Brothers, there was always an implicit Turkish superiorism, that uh, this super, uh, suprematism. So it, it may be that some of the Turkish Islamists ended up joining their Kurdish friends, but most of the radical movements coming out of these madrasas remain purely Kurdish. But perhaps Aslib meant something else. Uh, I think uh, that's. Uh, uh, you, there's other questions. Sufficient response. Thank you. There are more questions, so I would like to uh, move forward. Our next question is from Yüksel Serinda. He 
has a couple of questions, but I, I think you should uh, address only some of them, but I'm gonna read more <laughs> of yeah, questions sure. from him so that you see the context. How widespread was the madrasa in Kurdistan? Was there a central madrasa in Kurdistan? Can we call single malas, malas as a madrasa institution? Um, is there a difference between Kurdish sheikh and malas as far as madrasa institution is concerned? Um, I think this part is more interesting. In what language was the education language in Amude Kurdish? Uh, can you please name a few of the resources in the curriculum taught in the madrasa? Um, okay. Finally, were there any coordinated relationships between established madrasa, between Bidlis, uh, Ahmadiyya, etc.? So that's, these are questions from Yuxan Serinda. Uh, well, I, I'll Let's keep okay. it brief. We have more questions. Uh, yes. we, okay. Um, well. Thank you. I do not know how widespread the madrasa was. The, the madrasa, the existence of madrasa had its ups and downs. There were periods when there were more madrasas open in the 1950s, for, for instance, and then in the 60s, they were closed down. In the 70s, they opened a little. And under the AKP, I think the, the type of coexistence of state institutes with madrasa education was more or less tolerated so that we have a new type of semi-madrasas in, in the surroundings of a formal uh, state institute. Was there ever a single madrasa? Well, there were a few very prestigious madrasas. Uh, for Turkey, I think the madrasa of Nehri in Shemdinan, Hakkari, was central. It was, a, as you may have said, the modern madrasa of which were secondary madrasas in the whole region along the southern board of Lake Van, all the way to Bitlis. You find another cluster of madrasas north of Diyarbakir, Silvan, very important center where Mujahid is from. Um, nationally famous for a long, when I was, Doing my first research in the 70s, the most famous madrasa was that of Norshin. I did not visit it, so I do not know whether it was still functioning, but it had been the longest functioning madrasa with the greatest prestige, but it had also had a lot of oppression. In the madrasa, the, although the, the sheikh who founded it was both a sheikh, both a leader of a Sufi order, and an alim, a teacher, a mudaris, who was teaching the Islamic sciences, Later we see a, a, a differentiation. There is the sheikh, and it's the sheikh who has most disciples who come and visit him and who are strongly attached to him, who devote him as a superhuman person. And the teaching of the Islamic sciences was delegated to people who were specially trained. And the most famous of the teachers of Norshin was Sadratin Yüksel. Sadrettin Yüksel had to leave and settled in, uh, in Istanbul later. And since he left, I think the teaching was rather minimal in Norshin. I think this is what I can, it can answer in these short moments. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is uh, from Dilshad Mohammed, uh, you mentioned Amude, which reflects the trans-border aspect of madrasas. It says, to what extent would using the madrasa as an analytical tool be useful in understanding yet another level of the trans-border aspect of Kurdish nationalism? Mm -hmm. Or these are not related? This is the question. Mm -mm. Yeah, I think especially for the 1930s, uh, Amuda was especially important for many. It was a time when the border was not yet all that strictly closed. It was still possible to, to cross relatively easily. I see Ramazan Aras nodding. He has written a book about it. Uh, <clears throat> there were two madrasas in, uh, two great madrasas in Amuda. One, a Hanafi madrasa. And that obviously attracted Turkish students from Turkey. And the other, a Shafi'i madrasa, that attracted most of the Kurdish, the Kurds studying there. 
Now, most of the Kurdish students in the madrasa were quite isolated from the surrounding population. I don't think there was much exchange. So in that sense, it did not play a very important role in cross-border identity. Apparently, after 68, the madrasas were also partially suppressed in Syria. I was in Amuda in 76, but I did not visit any madrasa. I heard about madrasas, but again, people were talking about them as if they were institutions that had existed until recently. I was not sure whether it was actually functioning. Nowadays, many people from Turkey, Kurds as well as Turks, do study, well, before the fighting started in Syria, do study in Damascus. There is the Naqshbandi Sheikh, there was, he recently died, Ahmad Kaftaru, who had support from the state. He was a Naqshbandi Sheikh, uh, and he had a school called the Abu Nur Institute, which draws students from all over the world, many from Turkey, but also from places like Japan, Indonesia, and so on. And in those institutions, yeah, connections were formed. But again, people knew that he was Kurdish and he was proud of being Kurdish, but he was not a nationalist. He was a Muslim and for him, there was no real difference between Kurds and other Muslims. So with the Kurdish movement, he has never had anything to do, anything none of his students had. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have two related questions from uh, our colleagues, Ramazan Aras and Leila Neisi. Ramazan's question is, how do you interpret the transformation from madrasa system founded by great families, Emirs, to village madrasas? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, is this related to decline in power in diverse aspects? And how do you interpret diffusion of madrasa education system to the masses? Uh, so do you see this vernacularization of madrasas as a rising impact of madrasas on the Kurdish community? Mm -hmm. That's Ramazan's question. Uh, Leila Neizi, I'm going to read this one as well, and you can respond. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you think that historical changes and the need to silence madrasas changed who became madness in the sense uh, that they were more associated with urban higher status families earlier, whereas over time it was villagers? who became Meles, especially in Republic of Turkey. Also the issue of the Kurdish language and its use in the madrasas, especially for communication between students as opposed to in other schools. Okay, so this is about the kind of change in the status of the people who become Meles. Yeah. yeah. I, I am so ignorant. There are so many things that I really do not know. I can, I can only speculate. Uh, how these big families, or how, how education given in the schools of these big families gradually spread via secondary, somewhat less bigger, lesser big families to even lower level education. I mean, there is hardly any documentation about this. We know about the big families. And I've been, been interviewing members of the families. I know that precisely because they have such big families and prominent and visible, and because some members of the families took part in the Kurdish movement and were affiliated with uprisings, uh, they suffered more state oppression than the secondary families. There's a, a series of big families of ulama who were known by the Kurds to be people who are friendly to Ataturk, who had hosted Ataturk during the First World War and who had pleaded their loyalty during the war of what, what Turkey calls the War of Liberation, the fighting against Armenians and, and so on. But even these people were uh, deported to the West and their schools closed. So, and I think that, but this is speculation that because of the closure of the great schools that could offer a high quality of education, education 
shifted to less visible places. It was given by people who were drawing less attention, were less well known, and had perhaps just village backgrounds. Now, some of these big families may also have had village backgrounds, but they owned houses in the city as well as in the village. Um, The relation between Kurds and cities is uh, has always been a very complex one. Kurds were originally not fit, not townspeople, but they had representatives in the city. Uh, big tribes usually had partners who lived in the city, or some members of the tribe settled in the city. Some members of the tribe got an education and got got an urban job. So Kurds. Kurds gradually entered the cities, but cities for a long time were an alien element in Kurdish society. The cities were was where the state and big international trade was located. Now, Kurds, of course, had to do with the state and they had to do with traders, but the city was the, the, the interface. Prominent Kurdish personalities were not necessarily urban people, but some prominent people established branches that were urban, that had that owned houses, uh, big houses in places like the Arbukir. Um There was a question about language in the madrasa, which I passed before, and I've heard it come back in one of the, the last two questions. Um, as far as I know, but this is not based on actual observation, except this, this one time in Kurdish is used as the medium of instruction for communication and explanation at beginning levels. But when the student advances, all the reading is in Arabic and more and more the explication also becomes Arabic. People have to learn to speak Arabic. The Arabic you speak in the madrasa is perhaps not the same as Arabic that Arabs speak on the street. It is a very much a book inflected Arabic and the pronunciation may be heavily Kurdish, uh, but the, in the Madrasa Milieu people, because they communicate in Arabic, that Kurdish becomes very, very much Arabized also. You recognize people from Madrasa by the heavy, the pronunciation of some of the Arabic consonants, which are not pronounced properly in, in ordinary Kurdish, and also by the use of lots of Arabic expressions, words and expressions. But Turkish has never played a very important role in the, in the Kurdish madrasa. That's perhaps an interesting fact. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. One, uh, probably a quick answer will uh, be great. Do you have an idea of how many the number of madrasas in Turkey in late 19th century? How many madrasas were there? We don't know. And... A comparison, uh, what makes the Kurdish madrasa distinguishable, if anything? What can we say about it from a comparative perspective? What makes Kurdish madrasa special? That's one question. Um, there's a question from um, Jean Bahal, and I think Özlem Bor's question is also similar. Could you explain the role of madrasa in the formation of Kurdish nationalism? That's a big question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, they're all well, questions without answers, unfortunately. I have no idea about the numbers. I know a few individual cases, and I do not know how much this can be generalized. Um, there is, let me take a book that is sitting beside me. Uh, two or three years ago, Kadri Yildirim. Uh, wrote a three-volume book, three-fat volume, about madrasas. In Houston, he himself has some madrasa background. Uh, oh, no, no, in Ilahiyat, a, a theology background. Um, he writes about madrasas. He gives information about madrasas that he finds in early Arabic sources and uh, history. It is... It's an inventory, and 
but we do not know how many madrasas there are. He lists many madrasas, he gives, but it's not clear on which period he writes. Sometimes he gives madrasas that are mentioned in sources three, four centuries ago, and others, especially when he speaks about what I call the vernacular madrasas, of which there is a long list, uh, it is not really clear what his sources are. It's also not clear to what extent they actually function, but he has names of, of teachers. Uh, if you're really interested in answering this question, I certainly su suggest you, and you can read Turkish, you should order these books. They're called Kurt Medreselleri by Alimleri, published by Avesta Books. What makes the Kurdish madrasa special compared to what? Compared to Turkish madrasas? Turkey. Contemporary Turkish madrasas don't exist. Um, madrasas, as I studied them in Indonesia, who have the same curriculum as the Kurdish madrasas, are enormous, large institutions. They have never been suppressed in Indonesia and they are partly integrated into the uh, curriculum in, into the educational system in Indonesia, they have a high, a relatively high prestige compared to Kurdish madrasas. In Turkey, the discourse has always been that madrasas are places for lazy and stupid people. Madrasa students are often accused of being sapuk, of being uh, um, having uh, what is sapuk in English. Well, any, something very negative. Yeah, deviant or psycho, or whatever yeah. <laughs> works. Um, what makes it special is, uh, I think what what was special to it for me is that the, the projects of the madrasa that I have met in my life have struck me as very, people with a very strong sense of self and uh, greatly respected by the community, as long as they lived in a traditional community. Their authority was questioned when more young people got a modern type education. And those with a modern type education often think that modern education is far superior to learning those uh, things by heart that are not useful for life. Uh, the role of the madrasa in Kurdish nationalism. Um, well, I think Kurdish nationalists are nowadays using the symbol of the Kurdish madrasa as one major institution which has kept Kurdish culture alive in spite of all oppression by states. It's perhaps an exaggerated argument, but you might argue that assimilation would have been much more successful hadn't it been for the Kurdish madrasa and everything associated with the Kurdish madrasa. The fact that the Kurds belong to a legal school in Islam, which is different from the legal, the official legal schools of Syria, Turkey, Iraq, and Iran, is quite important. It is one difference. And the madrasa is an institution that emphasizes this difference. So the madrasa is an institution that emphasizes something that is special for the Kurds in that region, although it unites them with people elsewhere, like in, uh, in Yemen, where there, where there are many Shafi'is, in South India, or in Indonesia, where Shafi'i is the dominant legal school. Okay. Um, there are three questions that are related about Melas and their work, especially in relationship to the uh, state, Turkish state. One is Melas who rejected uh, be being paid by the state, uh, arguing that receiving salary from the state was haram. Um, I wonder if he asks, uh, that's Hanifi Barish, uh, if Martin has something to say about this phenomenon. Gökçen Beyinli's question is, uh, uh, in, until 1965, Medrese graduates could find a position in Dianet. Could you elaborate more on that point? And were there any women 
girls educated or women or girls educated in madrasas? I guess the answer to that is quick. Uh, the third one uh, from Akutash, this is about khutbas, uh, is asking if there are any Kurdish khutba ontologies prior to recent civil Juma movement. Um, and um, uh, this, what strategies the Kurdish madrasas adopted at the time of Turkification of khutbas from 1927 on, basically, that's more the uh, heart of the question. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, Hanifi's question about Mella who rejected salary as salary from the state as haram, I'm, it is possible that there were such Mellas, but I have not met anyone or heard directly from anyone who knows a specific person. Uh, it might well be, just a uh, a hoax, this story. Because I do not think there are strong reasons to reject a salary if you have to exist. Yes, but it, it is possible. But I I have no no information. Uh, I'm not aware of female students in madrasas. That does not mean that there are not, because we know that in some religious families, women did get an education. And I mentioned Ahmad Kaftaru, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the Kurdish uh, sheikh and Muderis, a professor of Islamic sciences in Damascus. His daughter is both a, a leader of the Sufi order with only female followers, and she was also teaching as a professor in uh, Abu Nur. So she has had a personal uh, religious education, madrasa style education from her father. But to my knowledge, there were no um, girl students in madrasas. Interesting, the Abu Nur Institute, which, is, which has a similar curriculum to the Kurdish madrasas, the Abu Nur Institute apparently has a section for female students. That's where uh, um, <clears throat> Kaftaru's daughter teaches. Khutba okay. ontologies. Well, that's an excellent idea. I wish I had come. I had thought of that before. I should have liked to collect them myself. I'm not aware. Uh, I, I suppose some of the khutbas were recorded there were not altogether all that many civil Juma prayers, uh, I believe. And uh, it should be possible by connecting the right people to find recordings of those uh, khutbas. That would be an excellent uh, subject uh, for research. Fascinating. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So I, there are some... Uh, folks who want to ask their questions directly, and I think it's a good idea. That gives yeah, them okay. from me, you know. Uh, so uh, we got Nejla Açık, then Frederike Yerding, uh, and uh, uh, and then we'll continue with Nick Cass. So Nejla, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Martin. It was great and really interesting. Um, I... I'm from Karer, Bingel, and my uncle, he had madrasa education. It must be 1950s or 60s, mm -hmm. and he's Alevi. So I'm just wondering to which extent his experience was common. So I assume he went to one of these village type of madrasas. Mm -hmm. I don't remember him being particularly like pro-Kurdish or pro-Turkish. Mm -hmm. So it's not, whatever he got there wasn't um, nationalist Kurdish, you know, mm -hmm or reading or Turkish one either but uh, and I don't think he went to state school because mm -hmm. there were many schools at that time so it was it's yeah. quite a rural area so do you know anything more about that is it common that Alevis back then used madrasas and I, I don't, don't think it's my Alevis here but I can understand a few reasons um there, there used to be an Alevi uh, uh, Dede, who had even an education at the, uh, the Ilahiyat Faculty in Ankara. Uh, 
uh, Mehmet Yaman did it. And the reason he gave is that although he is an Alevi, Alevis also need to have a burial in the Muslim style and certain prayers have to be said. So there has to be in every Alevi community, there has to be someone who is educated mm. enough in Islam in order to perform the, 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 the funeral prayers and to recite the proper dua. And that's why he studied and continued all the way to Ilahiyat. I suppose that in many Alevi communities, there were some local intellectuals who felt they needed to fulfill that particular role and took sufficient madrasa education in order to be able to lead a funeral prayer. But again, I'm speculating. I have never looked into this precisely, but it's an interesting. I mean, the reason you said that was the reason they mentioned for why they sent him there, exactly for that reason. To oh, ask. they sent him there even. Yeah, yeah. They sent him there to somebody, apparently uh, every Alevi family, probably from that region, sent one of their children to mm -hmm. America so they can perform these rituals. Um, during, you know, um, ceremonies like that. So what I was just wondering uh, how widespread that is really. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh, Frederick. Uh, hello, Martin. Hi, Frederick. Hello, we're in the same city, I think, in Utrecht. Okay. Um, Maybe my question is a little bit out of the ordinary, but I never really knew about um, how the education in the madrasa um, was organized. I thought it was in, in, a, in a class with a teacher, but you say it was often sitting in a circle with peer education, reading a book together and discussing it. Yes, there are, yeah. And it, it reminded me very much of um, that I, I spent some time in the PKK and there you have the ideological education. Mm -hmm. And part of that is in, organized in the same way. No. People sitting, sitting around reading. And of course, it's not religious education, but ideological education. Um, but have you ever spoken to people about this? Like, is it maybe more, more traditional Kurdish and does it, is it rooted somewhere in this system? Or am I... Um, is that totally not the case? Uh, it is not Kurdish. It is Muslim. It is it, it, you all over the Muslim world. You find the same type, the same method of education, where say so there's basically this what they call mutala'a is in the evening. Students prepare a text that they're going to read together with the teacher. They read in small groups together. When you read with a teacher, it is either private, one on one, that's in the higher level, where the teacher reads and sometimes explains. And later, in a later stage, the student reads out and the teacher may ask one or two questions about understanding the text. And there are uh, groups where they sit in a circle, a halka, around the teacher, where the teacher reads out a text with some basic explanation, and all the students read along, they all have a book or just a few pages of the book that they, where they follow, and they note in the margin some of the explanations of the teacher. You find it all over the world, and yeah. I don't think it is very surprising that the PKK has adopted that method because, well, they live with also very basic uh, infrastructure, I suppose. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. But you, did you ever talk about this with people in the in the Kurdish uh, movement about education within the movement and connection maybe to this system or? Um. No. no. Most people who set up this did not have a madrasa education. No. They later recruited, I mean, when the PKK became, say, in the um, early 90s, um, when they, it became a mass movement, they started branching out and they established a special organization for Alevis, a special organization for Yazidis, and especially two special organizations for Muslims, so, uh, Dean Adamlere for uh, 
religious personnel and for for pious Muslims. Uh, but I think the the educational system was never done by those Muslims. I mean, it was always the, the, the central group. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is um, Nicholas Cass. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Van Buren. And thank you very much. It's been very, very enlightening. Uh, thanks, uh, Mujahid, for for having this on. Um, a question I have is uh, with respect to uh, Sufism and uh, traditional life in Kurdish areas of northern Syria, and the impact of the PYD PKK uh, mm -hmm. revolution there. What what are the implications there in terms of uh, social stability? Uh, what has been the impact? Uh, do you think on uh, traditional ways uh, from the uh, the dominance of the PYD? Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Nick. I, I, I'm afraid I'll have to pass on that one. I have not been there for a couple of years. I have no idea. Uh, I would strongly believe that most of the Sufi circles do not look very friendly on the PKK and its style of politics. They are much closer to the, the alternative, the Barzani type Kurdish nationalists, if they have any nationalist feelings at all. When I was doing research in northern Syria, that's a long time ago, that was in uh, 75 and 76 and again in 1986 uh, I was looking um, at the Sufi groups and they had no relationship not even with the pro-Barzani or pro-Talibani Kurdish movements they felt that nationalism is nothing to do with religion they focused on religion although they were very Kurdish they had a strong Kurdish identity but they had no sympathy for any Kurdish nationalism any Kurdish political organization. And I don't suppose that has changed very much. Thank you. Our next is uh, Professor Alkan Özoğlu. Uh, would you like to... Uh... Okay, maybe I should read his question uh, unless he comes back. Uh, was there any competition among the madrasas perhaps in reference to the tariqa they belonged. Hmm. Hmm. I suppose there was, but finding a clear indication, I mean, it is not the madrasas themselves, but usually it is the followers of a leader who are the most fanatical, uh, in criticizing competing leaders. Uh, so yes, the, you might find people who say that my madrasa is the only real madrasa and our teacher has proper education and, and he's a real Sayyid. Oh, that's the competition. He's a real Sayyid. And there is a lot of competition about descent. Uh, being a, a proper descendant from the prophets is very important. And I remember speaking to the head of the family of Sheikh Said, and he actually said, well, there are so many families that call themselves Sayyids, and we know they are not. There are not many Sayyids in Kurdistan. I mean, nowadays, everyone wants to be a Sayyid, but they can't be. How can it be that, and so on. And he started mentioning a few families. Um, in the Ottoman Empire, there was an institution that uh, gave diplomas to families, stating that they were descendants of the Prophet. Uh, supposedly, after checking the genealogies, and if they are found credible, they were given a certificate that they were acknowledged as Sayyids. And there was a register of Sayyids. And there was an Akib al-Ashraf, uh, an official who was in charge of all the Sayyids. But we know that uh, several upstart families managed to get themselves recognized as Sayyids. We also know that there were families 
from whom the status of Sayyids was taken away. So this was an area where there was competition. They were competing over uh, legitimacy. But that is perhaps not the same as what he meant to ask. The competition about the quality of education, there might have been, but I am not aware of that. I have not heard of it. Uh, competition about the competition between different uh, Sufi orders with which they were affiliated? No. In the madrasa, the Sufi order is not important. And the Sufi order is serving different needs and a different segment of the population, usually older people. And the madrasa educates children, which is a different function. There's not, not much of a connection between the two. Very rarely do the children in the madrasa also study the, the Sufi order. Sufi orders left to the older people. Um, no, as in many other cases, my answers have to remain very unsatisfactory. You mean general, but they are certainly <laughs> satisfactory. <laughs> Thank you. Next question is from uh, Torio Roj, and it has to do with uh, Yezidi tradition. Do you think? Yezidi traditional religious education can be the assurance of Kurmanji's survival. As Madrasa tradition has died and no other Kurmanji teaching tradition exists, I think Yezidis would be the only community using this language in 50 or 100 years due to their religious affiliation to Kurmanji. Interesting question. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. And, uh, Yazidi religious education, but I don't think there is much Yazidi religious education. Uh, ordinary Yazidis do not receive religious education. Uh, some of the Sheikh families have their education in the family, but it is not systematic and it is not meant for a larger group. So, and certainly Yazidi religious education is definitely not meant for those who are not Yazidis. Uh, Yazidi is not a religion that you can join. It's a religion of a community that is closed and that, that accepts no new members, that, that does not have a sense of mission, that they have something to give to other people. Um, it's Perhaps. a point where the Yazidis will consider themselves or continue to consider themselves as Kurds. Some do and others think that they are an entirely different people, think that the Kurds are their worst enemies. Perhaps the question departs from the fact that the scripture is it the scripture is in Kurmanji? Maybe that's. Uh, is it? Um, I, I don't, don't know. I mean, in the first place, do Yazidis have scripture in the sense of written text? There are these two famous texts, the Mashaf al Rash and the Jilwa. Uh, the texts that we have are in Arabic and were written by a Christian who was very familiar with the Yazidis. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, the Yazidis themselves did not keep or maintain this text as far as we know. Yazidis do have an oral tradition, a very rich oral tradition in Kurmanji. But again, that is not to be divulged to people outside the Yazidi community. Okay. It, it, I mean, scripture and oral tradition are rather different things, I think. Okay. And Ramazan? Ramazan Aras. Okay, thank you, Mujahid. Um, thank you, Martin, for this inspiring talk and lecture. Um, in the recent past, when I was working on my board project, I came across to uh, Khaznavi, Naqshbandi Khaznavi Moritz, you know, yeah. crossing the borders in mm -hmm. the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And, in, and I have written something, a, a article on that issue. And while talking with Moritz, I was too much interested in this recruitment process of students to the madrasas, you know? Mm -hmm. So my question is going to be related to this, to have a kind of a genealogical exploration of this, that issue, you know, the transformation from uh, this um, early, early years, this Amir and, you know, you know supported mm -hmm. madrasa education to the Sufi oriented, and then this vernacularization of two madrasas. In this trans uh, transformation of this madrasa institution within the Kurdistan, in the Kurdish community, um, is there any, um, could you please comment on this recruitment issue of the students mm 
uh, this through this transformation to the madrasas, you know how how it was in the early stage, in the glory stage, and then then in the in the in the in the next stage and in the last period, you know, yeah, how how do you see the transformation in terms of this recruitment of students mm -hmm. to the madrasas, you know, and mm -hmm. how how it was in the past and how it has changed to the present. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Martin. Well, thank you, Ramazan. I, I, I have to be speculative again because the sources that I'm aware of do not tell us much. But I gather that in the, let's say, in the 17th century, when Evliya Celebi describes these madrasas, or in the 19th century, when, when the first big madrasas of uh, Maulana Khalid's uh, Khalifas uh, become very prominent, I do not believe that they appealed to the general population. They were educating only an elite. They were educating those people who were going to be those who were teaching in daily life, they were, who were going to be religious functionaries. Don't forget that in the, say, in the 17th century, villages did not have mosques. And I don't think in most village communities there was very little knowledge of Islam. Knowledge of Islam existed mainly in, in, in cities and at the courts of the Emirates. And the rest of the community had, I mean, they were nominally Muslim, but did, did not know very much about Islam and had not much guidance about Islam, apart from knowledge of charismatic figures. Like Evliya Chalabi describes this ancestor of Sheikh Said, the Rumiya Sheikh, as a man who, when Sultan Murad IV was on a military campaign from Istanbul to Baghdad, the, the population where he passed was ordered to bring food for the army. And Rumiya Sheikhi went there, followed by 40,000 of his murids, who were complaining about the taxation that the Sheikh imposed. So he was a figure with a, 40,000 is a symbolic number, obviously, but with a very wide following among the peasantry, people of the villages in a wide region, who saw him as a semi-divine figure, perhaps, a miracle worker who could plead for them with the this, with this Sultan. But not as a teacher, those people did not study in his madrasa. He had a madrasa in the city, which had perhaps a dozen or 20 disciples, people who were going to perform uh, major religious functions in, in, the, in the city and perhaps in the state apparatus. Um, I think the, the dissemination of education to the village is something that begins in the late 19th century, and it's part of the modern transformation. Uh, and early, early 20th, stories about people getting an ijazet as the, um, uh, as the mela of the 12 sciences and establishing their own madrasa. I think that must be from the, the, the turn of the century, late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, how do they recruit a new type of students? Well, they make ed education available in new places. You don't have to travel far to, to study anymore because you can get educated in your own village. But I think many people are watching have read the biography of Saidi Nursi, who grew up around that time, in the late 19th, early 20th century and who visited, I mean, he traveled quite widely. And many other people at that time who wanted to study, who wanted to get an education, did not go to just one, person, one uh, madrasa, but stayed in one place for a few months and then moved on to another one, study another book and yet another one. From which I gather that the madrasa curriculum was not yet all that standardized. And they went to a madrasa where the teacher was known as specifically knowledgeable about one particular book. So people still went along a, a number of different schools. And I think it's the next generation where you find that people stay in their own place and they get an education in their own village or a village nearby. And where the education in one single madrasa includes all these sciences. So it's a process of gradual simplification and systematization.
in which you find a different type of people entering the madrasa, probably, and also aspiring to a different type of career after completing it, becoming a village mala is perhaps a relatively new type of job. Okay. If we know that in the early 19th century, even many villages did not have a mosque, there was no need for a village mala, perhaps. Except for someone who could come and say the funeral prayers. But I don't know, I have to, I'm speculating. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we have two last questions. Hopefully, uh, quickly, if we answer them, then we will uh, conclude our session. I know people have been uh, patient and have been enjoying. Thank you very much because I, in you know in Turkey and Middle East time is it's late. much later. Yeah. So the first uh, question is why Jagar Queen and Mehmet I mean Bozarslan were against Madrasa institution, which was one of the major carriers of Kurdish culture. What did they offer as an alternative? This question is from Kenan Ansarioğlu. And the second question is from Ali Enesoğlu. Uh, his question is uh, a comparative question. Why did mainstream Kurdish religiosity ended up um, getting involved in violence while Turkish mainstream religiosity mostly stayed out of violence? Um, we begin with Jigga Khrin, who is himself, of course, a figure of Kurdish culture. Um, Jigga Khrin is from a very poor family. And going to a madrasa in Syria, in Amuda, was the only way he could get an education. And he complains that even when he was a student, he had to work as a slave of the teacher. He, his complaint is about the hierarchical relations in the madrasa world. He had to serve. He was humiliated day after day. He felt oppressed. And he started seeing the madrasa and organized religion as a system of oppression, and he turned against it. Uh, Mehmet Emin Bozarslan later also uh, turned against organized religion, but at the time he wrote his first book against uh, the Agas and Sheikh system, he wrote against the inequality, the oppression, against the superstitions, the beliefs that made the Sheikhs semi-divine figures who, who could help ordinary people enter heaven upon death. There's this famous saying, if you don't have a sheikh, your sheikh is Satan. Uh, Boz Aslan opposes very strongly that attitude. He does not criticize the madrasa as such. He criticizes the institution of sheikhhood. Uh, it is interesting that the, the, the last question speaks of violence and seems to assume that violence is unique to uh, Kurdish Islamists. Um, to my knowledge, among those people from Turkey who have joined uh, the Islamic State in the past years, we do find Kurds. There is a cluster from uh, Adiaman. There is a cluster from Bingöl. There are many people from Konya, some of whom may be Kurds. But I think all of all, there's, there's quite a few Turks among those who have joined the Islamic State. Uh, among those who joined the other uh, armed organizations in Syria, again, we find a quite high number of uh, people of Turkish and other ethnicities. And I do not think that Kurds are more prominent in those violent organizations. So I'm not sure whether the, the question is- Perhaps the- uh, From the, the right assumption. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I think the uh, probably 
what he has in mind is Hezbollah and such organizations. That yeah. Uh -uh. Kurdish religious or Kurdish Islamism ended up with more violence than Turkish Islamism. But yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I, in another talk, I had a question about Kurdish jihadism. <laughs> There is, a, there is a particular form of jihadism, which is Kurdo-jihadism, that I think this all comes from a perspective from which you look at things. Uh, it is true that we find in Kurdistan, which is the most underdeveloped, most oppressed, uh, most militarized part of Turkey, we find conditions that have led to all sorts of violence, political violence, religious violence perhaps, violence in the family. There are many conditions that have, that are structural and that have led to perhaps much more violence than elsewhere. On the other hand, there is this perception in Turkey that this is specific for the East, that in, in the West all is well. If you look at, um, we have just passed the 8th of March. If you look at femicide, the killing of women. I mean, in Turkey, there has been this presumption that uh, honor killings are very typically Kurdish. And it is true that there are Kurdish tribal values that endorse a particular style of honor killing. But if you look at the women actually killed by their relatives in Turkey, I don't think Kurds are particularly prominent compared to other ethnicities. And certainly if you correct for social position, social status, in Kurdistan itself, it's also the killings find mostly place among oppressed and poorest families. Well, I think <laughs> this, this, will, this will need a, a separate talk. Yeah, yeah. Well, most of the questions obviously, uh, you know, demand a lot of uh, discussion. But uh, thank you very much uh, for your illuminating it was uh, a great pleasure. remarks. Thank and you thank you invitation. all for participating uh, this event on behalf of Zara Institute. I would like to thank you all. And this concludes our uh, 